understand about ancient empires is that whatever their rationale, the reality is that these are organisms that live for conquest. These are organisms for whom tax collection and expansion really is their oxygen. These are the things that feed the lifeblood of the empire. Without these two, without continuing to expand your territories and therefore increasing the amount of loot in your coffers, empires begin to wither and die. The Roman Empire is exactly like all ancient empires. It stands and falls by its ability to conquer new territories. But in 9 AD, Roman invincibility took a severe beating. An entire Roman army, commanded by Publius Quintilius Varus, was defeated by a confederation of German tribes. It was a catastrophe, and it's become known as the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. Varus' army of three legions and nine auxiliary units was wiped out, wiped off the face of the map. That's more than a tenth of the entire Roman army gone in just a matter of days. We're told that the Emperor Augustus was shocked to his very core. He was horrified, he was grief-stricken, and he was furious. Um, we have painted a picture of him ranging through his palace, banging his head against the walls and crying out, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. Twenty years before the defeat in the Teutoburger Forest, Augustus had already begun to deploy legions in the area. It was an area known then as Germania Magna. And it was a dangerous area, populated by independent, warlike peoples. Augustus had come to power by winning a civil war and defeating Mark Antony, but he needed clean glory. He needed to be killing genuine foreign enemies rather than fellow Roman citizens. So he embarked on the greatest period of expansion the Roman Empire would ever see. So they now occupy much of modern-day Turkey, the Middle East, North Africa, Hispania. They go right up to Switzerland through Central Europe. But there's this infuriating problem and that is the province of Germania. Augustus can't take the risk, the strategic risk, that turning to the east and fighting the Parthians will open up Rome to attack by Germans. The man chosen to command the army and to control and to suppress the Germanic tribes is called Publius Quintilius Varus. Varus was trusted but not one of the very best. He was the sort of second most reliable commander around. Actually, probably the character to watch in this campaign is somebody called Arminius. Arminius was from one of the royal families of the Cherusci tribe, so he was a German aristocrat, a German prince, but he was also a Roman citizen. Arminius's job within Varus's army was to lead the auxiliary cavalry. And this is a really prominent, really potent position to be in. Romans brought in auxiliaries in order to provide capabilities that Romans themselves could not fulfill. Overall, the army was at least 50% non-Roman citizen, 50% auxiliaries. They provided the vast majority of the army's cavalry, and they provided troops like archers, slingers, men who were specialist troops. It's clear that Varus trusted Arminius, counted him as a friend, perhaps in a slightly patronizing way, but Arminius had dined at Varus's table on frequent occasions. But in private, he is plotting and planning. He wants to steal back from Rome his homeland, Germania. Arminius plans very carefully. He creates a false rumor of rebellion further east, which lures Varus away. He does what a Roman commander should do. He stamps out any sign of rebellion by marching straight at it, putting on a show of force. When the Roman army moves, it has got to have scouts in front, out on the flanks, and behind the trailing elements of the army to ensure that they are not ambushed. Arminius and his cavalry abandon the Roman army to join and lead a Germanic revolt. 
the loss of the German auxiliaries was an appalling blow to Varus. But also, these men who've now left you half blind have gone and joined the other side. For the Germans, cavalry were the perfect troops to spearhead and ambush. On the battlefield against dense infantry formations, they have limited ability. But when a column is strung out on the march, then cavalry with speed and surprise can strike quickly and punch holes in the line, leaving isolated pockets of men for other marauders to come down and mop them up. <laughs> The fighting lasted for four long days, and we're told that between 15 and 20,000 men were killed. Varus didn't behave like a proper Roman aristocrat. He gave in. Mentally, he collapsed. Perhaps he felt so betrayed by Arminius, this close friend of his who'd now turned enemy, that he gave up. And Varus took his own life early on in the days of battle. So Varus had lost, and that means that Rome had suffered one of the greatest defeats in its history. In the aftermath of the battle, you really feel the heat of the fury of these tribes against their would-be invaders, and the reprisals are simply brutal. The lessons of Teutoburg Forest are that tactically you need to keep your army balanced. You need to be able to maintain that diversity of troop types to meet any situation. Strategically, you need to make sure that if you're expanding your empire, you can support it to the front line of the borders. The Romans discover that a natural border is the best border and that the great rivers of Europe, the Rhine and the Danube, are the safest northern border the Roman Empire can have. The Battle of Teutoburg Forest might only have taken four days, but because this was a moral as well as a military defeat, it has never been forgotten. It was always this thorn in the side of the flesh of the Romans, and for those in Europe, it became this kind of watchword for resistance and for the possibilities of power. And so it's always been written about in history, in poems, in literature. Great paintings have been done of the Battle of Teutoburg, and we still talk about it today. Varus, give me back my legions! Years ago, a hero lived, a charismatic man who changed the course of global history. Yet his name, Arminius, or Herman, or Armin, is seldom heard. The Romans knew him as Arminius. Here is his story. Arminius was a Germanic prince who, with the greatest distinction, served the Roman Empire. He commanded their first German auxiliary cavalry and achieved the status of Roman citizen and knight. As a boy, Arminius and his younger brother, Flavus, were taken to Rome and indoctrinated and trained to promote the glory of the ever-expanding Roman Empire, this also being a custom of the Romans to borrow the sons of barbarian chieftains for a time for just this purpose. But upon return to his homeland in Germania, Arminius witnessed the tyranny and oppression of his own people at the hands of the Roman occupiers. The Germanic tribes were fiercely independent and racially Nordic and not accustomed to the imposition of unfair laws, physical abuses, and taxes without their consent. Justice became as foreign as the new Roman governor. Varus a privileged, yet lecherous, and loathsome tyrant. Varus was tasked by Augustus Caesar to bring Germania to her knees. As a tribal noble and commander of all of the auxiliary forces in Germania, Arminius was assigned to assist the Langerus, 
yet power consumed governor. Arminius knew the ways of both the Romans and the Germans and became an invaluable advisor. Arminius also met and fell in love with a beautiful German princess, Gusnelda. Gusnelda's father, Sege Estes, an ambitious noble who saw the benefits of serving Rome, condemned the union and became a bitter foe to Arminius. But the young lovers defied him and eloped setting off a string of events that changed the face of the continent. Many of the German nobles benefited by their allegiance to Rome, but the people suffered and Arminius and his bride became acutely aware. Unlike any other, he determined to free his people from the evils of Rome, although it meant risking title, wealth, and family. He secretly began to organize the ever quarrelsome tribes and planned to rid their lands of the invaders. This was an impossible task, as Rome, at the peak of her empire's power, had several invincible legions 12,000 battle-hardened and well-equipped soldiers plus their many attendants stationed in Germania. Also, the Germans were often pitted against each other, and many could not be trusted. In fact, such STEs would betray Arminius to Varus at a final banquet, exposing Arminius' revolutionary plans, before the Romans were to leave their summer encampment for their winter ride forts. But the Roman governor was so impressed by Arminius and the perceived ridiculousness of the allegation, that he did not believe the charges. Arminius had the wits and charm to turn this betrayal into a seemingly ongoing family squabble of Sejus's resentment for the loss of his daughter. Subsequently, during the trek, and with stunning surprise, Arminius did lead the unimaginable attack on Ar Rome's three best legions, totally destroying them and capturing their fallen eagles, in the year AD 9, exactly 2000 years ago. In fact, the major fight took place on the ninth day of the ninth month of the year 9, a strangely symbolic date 9-9-9. -9 -9. This defeat, regarded by authorities as one of the ten most important battles in man's long history, was partially enabled by Arminius' skill at deception learned from the Romans. But most important was Arminius' courageous leadership ability, his keen understanding of Roman tactics and his unique familiarity with the terrain and weather all enemies to the discipline, yet unsuspecting Roman soldiers with their traditional formations and predictable maneuvers. The gods also favored a Germanic onslaught by bringing down a torrent of cold rain, which further demoralized the weary and confused Romans. Arminius's success brought peace and self-rule to his people for a time, but it was to be short-lived. The Romans would return, under Tiberius Caesar's attempt a punitive reconquest of Germania. Arminius again rose to the occasion and led the Germanic resistance even fighting against his own brother, who remained loyal to Rome. Flavius was more impressionable when he was sent to Rome and its grandeur and debauchery had greater effect on his dogmatic character. Their dramatic confrontation across the Weser River is one for the ages, as Arminius publicly chastised his brother as a traitor to his folk. Arminius's victories and Rome's costly campaigns for reoccupation, under General Germanicus, ultimately led to Rome's abandonment of the conquest again, this time leaving for good. But during the most difficult times, Sege Estes betrayed his own daughter allowing Germanicus to take her without a fight and aiding the Romans in her capture. She was pregnant with Arminius's son, and they were never again to be reunited. But her noble bearing, and unwavering loyalty to her husband, were held in the highest regard by the Romans, even as she and her son were paraded. Rome in a triumphal parade. Arminius's story is one of love and of noble sacrifice for the most honorable of causes the freedom of his people. He spent years trying to further unify the tribes and establish a form of nationhood, which might have enabled the return of his wife and son, but he was undermined by power-hungry rivals. Ironically, it was Roman historians who recorded the deeds of Arminius, and their writings reflect the greatest respect for their most capable and enterprising enemy the man who utterly defeated them on more than one occasion. Like a Greek tragedy, Arminius was eventually murdered and Germany's unification would need to wait for many centuries. 
In Germany today, Arminius, Arminius is regarded as their greatest hero in ancient era George Washington. It was a direct result of Arminius's defiance to the tyrannies of empire that ensured the northern half of Europe would not become Romanized, but rather Anglo-Saxonized the impact of which would resonate throughout the world and throughout history. In these lands, many of you were born before the days of tribute and remember the taste of freedom. Nature has given liberty even to animals. Is courage a special gift for men? The gods favor those who are braver. Death before slavery. Yeah! We have the courage. We will win our liberty. Our son will no longer be sold to the gladiator pits. Our daughters and wives will no longer be abducted and robbed of their virtue. We will pay no taxes for living on our own land. The work of our hands will stay where it belongs, in the hands that toil for it. Fight for your seat in the great hall, factories, We'll take you there, but save some drink for me! When you hear this horn sound, the horn of my father Sigma, you will know it is the time to strike. The twilight of the gods is at hand! Take your seat! Take your seat! No one knows. Even fewer care.